All right, good afternoon and welcome to our last Mesos University session actually today and for this MesosCon. So uh, Ben, Ben is a uh, software engineer at Mesosphere and he's gonna tell us all about what it takes to build like our first stateful DCOS service. And in particular, this is gonna utilize the SDK. So this is the underpinning for all the great services you might've heard today about in the uh, keynote. So all the smack stack services are basically based on the SDK. <laughs> And today, it's up to you to learn and write your first, also, stateful DCS service. Enjoy. Okay. Is this microphone working? Yes? Sweet. Uh, yeah, so I, I am Ben Wood. Uh, I work on the SDK team. Uh, the SDK team, SDK will be, we keep saying SDK. Uh, I'll explain a bit more about, like, what does that actually mean. Um, Cool. So first things first, you should go to bit.ly slash first stateful. Uh, every single command you see up here is in there, like with section titles and things. So you'll be able to follow along without trying to hand type uh, incredibly arcane commands, as well as a bunch of YAML. Uh, after that, you're going to want to do, so first in order of business, there's a lot of you. Uh, we don't have clusters for every single one of you, so we're going to do pairs or maybe triples, so basically like if you're sitting by yourself, you're doing it wrong, you should sit next to someone. And then when we hand out clusters, you'll pair up with somebody. Um, but you can definitely like follow along and, and type all the code on your own personal box. Um, but yeah, so you basically wanna do the Docker pull, Mesosphere, DCBus Commons latest. Uh, that's also in, if you went to the bit.ly thing first, you will see that and you can just copy and paste. Uh, it's just because our Docker image is a little bit big. Uh, but this is actually the image that all of our engineers and our CI system use for working with the SDK. All right, so everybody on board, bit.ly, first stateful, Docker, good, good, vague, vague acknowledgement, great. All right, so our agenda is, uh, I'm gonna go over an intro of like what is the SDK, what is the motivation behind it, how does it go about accomplishing what it sets out to do. Uh, then we'll do a bit of developer setup, basically get at least one laptop for every couple people, a few people hooked up to a cluster so you'll actually be able to deploy it and you know, do a little bit of debugging and then also just have you set up in general to um, write the code on your own machine. Then we'll do a very simple hello world, uh, sort of introduce you to the development cycle with the SDK. Uh, and then we'll do memcache. Uh, Jorg kept saying stateful, he said it so many times. Memcache is not technically stateful, right? Like it is a, it is an ephemeral cache. Uh, however, I know, that's fair. Uh, so however, however, uh, you, would, you would have a very unfortunate time trying to do what we're going to do with memcache on Marathon. Um, and we'll, we will use like leverage things like persistent volumes a little bit. Um, there's some element of, uh, my colleagues and I have stolen all the low hanging fruit for like implementing stateful distributed services. Like we already did Kafka, Cassandra, Cockroach, uh, Elastic, HDFS, and, and it's sort of like those ones, you know, I'll, I'll probably show a few of those at the end in terms of like what those real productionized YAMLs and a little bit of Java look like. But uh, so basically we'll, we'll do configuration templates um, and sidecar plans. Those are sort of two of the more useful in terms of uh, making a robust framework uh, features of the SDK, and then we'll sort of go over what you can't do, which is mostly going to be me telling you everything the SDK can do, and then a little bit of where we're kind of going with it. Okay, the intro. Neat. Who am I? Uh, I am a software engineer at Mesosphere. I work on the SDK team. There are about 12 of us. Uh, Gabriel Hartman, who gave a talk earlier today, uh, he is sort of the original author, um, and then one of the tech leads. I'm the sort of co-tech lead. Uh, I focus a lot on like process and how the, sh the team can ship like a really high quality SDK um, and like a bit more on taking the SDK and building really robust data services with it. My background is basically real-time performance monitoring. So I worked at a couple of companies where we suck in a bunch of data from users uh, around performance, like website performance, and provide value to Fortune 2000 companies. Uh, and then also in doing that, did a lot of infrastructure automation. Um, and so the SDK, what does the SDK mean? The SDK is fundamentally a GitHub project under Mesosphere org called DCOS-Commons. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes we're like, we'll, we'll call it DCOS-SDK, but hey, it has the name it has, right? 
So let's walk through a little bit. OK. Like why the SDK? Distributed systems are hard. Mesos is a pretty good approach to you know, abstracting the hardware of a distributed infrastructure. Um, who here has written the Mesos scheduler? It's really hard, right? Like, I, right, like a, an onboarding task at Mesosphere. If you are a Mesosphere employee, one of your onboarding tasks, engineer, we do not make the accountants do this, uh, is you write a Mesos framework. And it's like, neat. Uh, with the person who most recently joined our team, he was like, oh, yeah, I made this cool batch scheduler. It only took me like a few hours. And I'm going to try persistent volumes. And we all kind of just like snickered. And we're like, OK. And then two days later, Evan's like, ah. And we're like, yeah, we did that already. Uh, so right, like, like Mesos is a fantastic hardware abstraction, but it is wily. Like, you got to really deal with a lot of weird edge cases. And, and I think, right, like, we've seen it. Like, there, there are only a few truly successful schedulers. What I think we've seen is, is people trying to do specific data services, like OrangoDB has made a pretty good framework, um, but they have written tens of thousands of lines of C++ to do it, right? And no one should have to write more than, like, zero uh, of C++. So additionally, you know, the, the SDK essentially targets DCOS. And DCOS is a very powerful system. It has, like, you know, right, you can think of it as it's, it's Mesos plus Marathon plus a bunch of really fantastic um, orchestration and sort of, you know, service discovery, all these wonderful things. But it also is kind of hard to leverage, right? Like, you can, you can leverage it in Marathon, but, like, if you want to do it yourself, it's kind of tricky. And then also, um, so, like, right, like, how, how can we try to solve this with, like, an actual platform with an SDK? And, right, you might say, like, well, Cassandra is pretty different from HDFS. And, like, Rrr. it's like, yeah, but, like, if you squint at most distributed systems, right, like if you, you sort of blur your vision, it's like they start to look really similar. Right? Like, it's, it's like 90% similarity. They all care about deployment. They care about how do you recover when any given node type goes down. They care about upgrades. They need service discovery. You want to have performance metrics. Like, there's all this stuff, right? And you can sort of see, like, DCOS and Mesos have the primitives of all of that, right? And we want to just very easily sort of provide you a clean abstraction right, for combining all of that together. So what is the SDK? Uh, it is a declarative orchestration abstraction for Apache Mesos and DCOS. Fundamentally, it is an Apache Mesos scheduler factory, right? You give it some input in the form of YAML or a bit of Java. And what do you get on the other side? You basically get a jar. That jar knows how to deploy your service very well. All right, so in terms of where does it live? So if you want to look at the docs, which is probably the best entry point to it, uh, there's actually a link. Um, uh, at the bit.ly link, the first staple in that gist. Um, so there's, there are docs upon docs upon docs of all the features. Um, I'll probably, if we have a bit of time at the end, I'll sort of take us through those where you can sort of pull out the key value. So what do you get if you use the SDK, right? Because you might think, like, well, I can just write a Mesos scheduler. It's pretty simple, the thing that I'm doing. It's like, yeah, sure. Uh, we probably, right, there's, there's a handful of very good Apache Mesos schedulers out there in the world. Um, but like Aurora and Marathon and like Apple's never going to open source Jarvis. Uh, well, maybe, never say never. But right, like they're, they're very specific. And, and primarily like the two particularly good ones, Aurora and Marathon, are these sort of mono schedulers, right? And they're, they're kind of hard to customize, hard to extend if you want to. Like I have had to look at the Marathon code base. It is a good, powerful piece of software, but oh, so much Scala. Uh, so we've built an incredibly good default scheduler, right? Like it is, we've, we've written uh, six services on top of it that we're, you know, selling to folks to run their data solutions on top of, right? Like we, we've gotten very good at building stateful data services with this SDK. Uh, so it covers, you know, deployment, updates, recovery. You can do powerful custom orchestration. And then additionally, it does tightly couple with DCOS in terms of, security, networking, service discovery, right? Like sort of fundamentally, like it would more or less work out of the box on top of just raw Apache Mesos, except that raw Apache Mesos doesn't force you to have DNS, right? Like that's sort of the fundamental thing that's missing. Um, if you had Mesos DNS or, uh, so D2S has Spartan, which is the uh, fancy, the fancier DNS we recently added. Um, additionally, there is, so the D2S CLI uh, has a sort of concept of modules, so every service gets auto-generated sort of an operator module for interacting with it. 
And then additionally, that what is that doing? It's basically just talking to a REST API that is served by the scheduler. Uh, talked about powerful custom orchestration, so there's the sort of uh, plans logic we'll go into, but additionally, you can extend scheduler behavior very deeply by writing a bit of Java. We have nice, we have okay hooks for diving into the sort of uh, actual Java that is you know, interpreting the declarative API and turning it into orchestration. Uh, additionally, there are 12 people that work on this full time, right? Like we are, every time like it, something lands in Apache Mesos, and then as soon as like DCOS can like supply it to us, and then like boom, we implement it, right? Like we have a very tight relationship with Apache Mesos for obvious reasons, because we work at Mesosphere. Uh, we want all those new features. We're also pushing like a lot of the things that have come out for Mesos and for DCOS are pushed forward by the drive towards like can we do these big stateful complicated systems on top of these platforms. So there is a very benefit, there is a, a I don't know, good cycle, words escape me. Um, okay, so what is the SDK ultimately? So essentially the, the SDK has three core interfaces, like what the, the SDK is driven towards, so essentially there is uh, two programming time interfaces, the declarative API and the programmatic API. Declarative API is in YAML, programmatic API is in Java, and then at runtime you have the REST API for interacting with the service. So a declarative API, what does it look like? Uh, so you have a service name, neat. Uh, you then have pods and plans, right? So pods are what are you going to run? Plans are how are you going to run it? When are you gonna run it? What should it do, right? So pods, uh, in terms of, um, let me see what I have, there we go. Uh, so pods, right? So here's some kind of fake pods that I made up, but essentially a pod is a set of tasks Translated into Mesos land, a pod is a Mesos executor, and a task is a Mesos task group. The reason for that is essentially Mesos task groups are atomic units. Everything in a task group has to fail together. We don't want to do that if we're running your database, right? We want like the database task to be separate from the maintenance tasks so that they can be turned on and off separately, fail separately, et cetera. So as you can see here, we basically have two different pods. You can define a count. There are dozens and dozens of different parameters in the YAML, all documented in the documentation I linked you to. Um, but essentially, you, know, you can do all the obvious basics. You can define a command. You can set CPUs. You can set memory. It's not shown here. We'll see it in the tutorial. You can set a Docker image. Uh, we don't do the standard, like, a lot of orchestration systems, they're just like, Docker, and then they run whatever the Docker thing is supposed to run. We don't do that, right? We basically use Docker as a file format to present, you know, uh, bundle dependencies, and then we launch everything with the universal container runtime. We don't touch Docker at all. Um, okay, so that's the declarative API in terms of pods, right? So again, this is like, what do we want to run? Now, plans are pretty powerful, and they allow us to define both deployment. So there's sort of a, there is a built-in, like, if you define no plans, what would happen if I installed this? Like, well, what's going to happen is when our scheduler parses this, it just sees, oh, I have two things that have a goal state of running. I want five of pod B, and I want one of pod A, and it's gonna go like, well, I'm gonna serially launch one pod A, but I'm only gonna turn on task A1, because it has a goal state of running. I don't know what to do with a task that's finished. And then pod B, it's gonna be like, well, I'm gonna serially launch five of these, right? And it's like, obviously, that, that is trivial that is like the naive case that, that doesn't, that none of our services, right? Like none of them, the naive case is actually correct, but it's like, it's good to have a default. So plans cover a number of things, right? So they cover deployments. We also have a separate update plan. We'll have in the future the ability to do relatively complex upgrade plans for things like database migrations, file format conversions, stuff like that. Um, and additionally, you can define something called sidecar plans. So sidecars are essentially uh, auxiliary tasks within a pod, right? So if we look back here, task A2 would be considered a sidecar, right? Like it has this goal state of finished, right? Well, not necessarily a sidecar, but it has a goal state of finished, right? So there's two possible goal states. There's running and finished. Running means always make sure I am on. If I fail, bring me back. Finished means keep trying until I succeed and then stop. Do not bring me back. Right? Now there's a series of different interactions. Um, you can do some cool stuff, like obviously you can have a bootstrapping task. A great example is if you look at our HDFS framework, 
we basically do some, uh, we like format the name nodes. Those are essentially tasks with a finished goal state. Then after that, we actually start the name node server, right? Additionally, you can do sidecars where you might define a plan where an operator is going to run it. A great, we're going to go over one today. We're basically going to, so we're going to do memcache. As I said, one of the things we're going to do is define a sidecar that flushes the cache, right? So you can, you can tell memcache individual instances, like, hey, flush your cache. We're going to define a sidecar that is, allows an operator to say, hey, flush the entire cache of everything. And it'll just either serially or in parallel go through and flush the cache for everything. So plans are basically built up of, so here, deploy is the plan. It has an overall strategy of serial, which basically means for all of my phases, go through them serially. Within a phase, so here we have pod A phase. You can also, again, have a strategy. A phase operates against a pod. A step, which you don't actually see any here, but you'll see them later. A step is essentially uh, what should happen for an individual pod instance, right? Excuse me. So you can have you know, different configurations of this sort of thing. If you look at our Elastic framework, it's actually a really good example of different deploy and update plans. Uh, for deployment, Elastic doesn't care. Just like throw all the nodes out there, right? And then for update, you do care for all sorts of reasons, availability, things like that. So then it has a separate update plan that is much more careful about sequencing of how it's rolling out new binaries. <clears throat> all right, programmatic API. Uh, not really going to show you any examples. If we have time at the end, uh, I'll go over a couple. Um, basically, if you look at anything but Elastic, they all have custom recovery. I'll, show you, I'll at least show you where to look so you can look at the examples. Um, so essentially, the scheduler can be extended by writing Java to add custom recovery. So that's things. A great example is Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra, when you replace a node, you need to somehow communicate to the ring, this node is going away. right? Because and by, So there's a distinction between restarting and replacing. Restarting a node means cycle it in place. Replace means throw it away, unreserve the resources, find somewhere new to put it, right? Like replace is uh, the rack broke, or we're taking that rack away, so all of those instances need to go away. So replace, you have to do a little bit of custom logic, detect that like, oh, this is a permanent replacement. OK, I need to go and tell the ring, hey, this one's going away. Um, yeah, and then additionally, a good example of this is our own Agile B framework. Uh, they have to sort of, oftentimes, the things you will do in Java, you're essentially either hacking around the fact that we're net, that the SDK does not plan to support something, or it's like in our future, right? It might be like, I need to iterate over a list. And it's like, neat, you can write some Java to do that. Uh, so essentially, the service spec is the in Java representation of the YAML. And you can then you know, take that service spec, and you might have an NVAR that is a big list, and you're like, great, I actually need to add a port for every single one of those things, things like that. The REST API, uh, the endpoints you actually really care about. So endpoints, which is all about telling you how to connect to your services. We'll see an example of that on uh, memcache, right? Like, neat, I deployed a service, but I actually really care about talking to it. The endpoints API is all about revealing to you, the user, how do I actually talk to it, right? You can, you can very carefully curate like, what does and doesn't get revealed. It's not sort of just a barf of like, here's every port and IP address this has ever used. Plans, so plans are all about receiving information about the individual plans, deploy, recovery. Uh, deploy and recovery are the two built-ins. Deploy is how does it bring stuff up. Recovery is, is a reactive plan that's basically looking for failed um, or, yeah, basically looking for failed tasks. And uh, then any sidecar plans. You can also perform oper like a number of different operations on any given plan. And pod is just a way to look at pod and task state. You can also perform operations on the pod. So I alluded to you can restart a pod, which basically means restart it in place, bring up any tasks that should be running according to the current plans. And then there's replace, which is throw it all away, unreserve the resources, destroy the data, and move it somewhere else. You shouldn't do replace ever, or often, at least. There are cases where you might want to do a replace. You should test replace when you write a framework, like, oh, you really should test it. Uh, it is a great test of, is my recovery actually good? OK, so uh, how do SDK services like, actually run in DCOS, right? Like, what is, what is the true output of the SDK? So fundamentally, what you care about is you need to be able to install it, right? So the, the true output of the SDK like a truly fully compiled output is a DCOS package. So what is a DCOS package? A DCOS package 
is a set of instructions, which are basically some package metadata, some resources that that package will utilize, like basically URIs, and an options file that essentially defines all of the parameters of the service, and a templated marathon app. Cosmos is the package manager for DCOS, so Cosmos knows how to translate those first three files and that marathon app definition into a launched marathon app, right? So fundamentally, what we spit out is a jar and a package definition that when we hand that to Cosmos, it ultimately launches a single instance of the scheduler as a marathon app. So, which is great, marathon will make sure the scheduler sticks around. Uh, we operate under a concept of we don't need the scheduler to be like HA or anything because it's like, you know, your tasks live if the scheduler is dead for a tiny little bit, Marathon will always bring it back. In terms of configuration updates and things like that, what it means is ultimately Marathon is killing the scheduler and bringing it back up with a new configuration whenever you do any sort of configuration update. Upgrades are basically just configuration updates that change binaries. So it's the same deal, you know, you're doing a package update and you're ultimately just restarting the Marathon app with a new configuration it's going to see, oh, this URI changed, and it's going to go and download it. So essentially, what does that mean, right? So Cosmos, the user issue is DCOS package install. Cosmos sees that. It renders and launches the Marathon app. Marathon receives that request. It launches a single scheduler instance. The service scheduler then comes up, registers with Mesos as a, as a framework, and then it starts to receive offers and put tasks out. So you can see in my terrible topology diagram, uh, that essentially what that means, you have the masters off to one side, the scheduler is coexisting with its tasks and its pods. Each of those pods is a little executor that's running some number of tasks. Okay, does so anybody have like three minutes of questions? Anybody have questions? No, all right, neat. Okay, uh, a note on polyglots. Uh, the SDK is complex, it contains Go for the CLI and our task bootstrap, Java for the core scheduler, about 55,000 lines of it, uh, Python 3 for testing, there's some bash in there. So what that means is we're all very sad about it. But the good news is we recently added a Docker container, so you have all of that bundled together that is supposed to be the Docker container you are all pulling already. So what are we gonna have to do to get set up? We're basically gonna download a template. So I have gone through the labor of making it so we have a nice little GitHub repository where all we're gonna need to do is touch YAML. Like we are, we are not gonna touch the Java, we'll take a peek at it, we're not gonna have to go through the setup of like bootstrapping the whole configuration and all that stuff. We're just gonna touch the YAML, it'll speed things along nicely. Um, we're gonna do everything inside the Docker container. Uh, I'm going to show you some AWS credentials um, that are very temporary and will disappear after this. Um, and then we'll do a DCOS CLI setup and I forgot to take it off, but we're not actually gonna use the private key. Um, so neat, this is all on the gist that I had you grab. So basically you just wanna do git clone of this, then we're gonna change into that directory Oh, yeah, I have my GitHub set up a little weird. Um, does that make sense to people? You can also switch it to, here, I'll show the. But this is H is faster. Also true. This is gonna be a great test of our conference Wi-Fi. Um, I'll throw the other one in here as well. Okay, everybody good? Got the file? Did we change into the directory? If you didn't change into the directory, change into the directory. Neat. <clears throat> All right, so enter the Docker container. Uh, I mean, you can, you can change the working directory and where I mounted it, feel free, uh, but this command will get you in there with all the right things. It is also in the gist. That is the default of the repo, yeah. Uh, the YAML file, yeah, the YAML file is already there. 
We're basically just going to hit build once we're all set up. All right, everybody in the Docker container that wants to be. Oh, it's still downloading? All right, neat. All right, well, uh, yeah, all right, neat. I was uh, pretty sure this would happen. Uh, I'm very glad we had not optimized that for size yet. All right. Uh, so let's just start going over it. And uh, if you can sort of just like, I don't know, we'll, we'll check in in 10 minutes on how we're doing on the Docker image. Who does not? Raise your hand if you want to have the Docker image and you do not have it yet. OK, we're like 50%. All right, neat, neat. If you have a phone you can tether with, it might be faster. Um, yeah, all right. I love conference Wi-Fi. Uh, if I was better at my job, I would have told you all to download this sooner. Um, OK, thanks, Google. You're bad at emoji. So let's talk about what we're going to see. So actually, here. I have so much time to kill, I'm just going to do it like this. OK, so this is the template. Essentially, if you said build.sh, this would build and output what we call a stub universe. So universe is the sort of package repository. There are a couple different ways to generate one. A stub universe is basically a JSON file that you can add to your cluster as a repository and then install from there. So let's take a quick peek. Uh, due to the wonders of Java, what we end up with is very deeply nested, our service.yaml. So as you can see, I'm calling it memcache already because that's where we're headed. And feel like changing it later. Um, I'm sending here the scheduler. It's going to run everything as the user nobody. Uh, and I'm basically just saying, neat, let's have a pod that says uh, hello to us. Cool, right? So we basically have here's our pod, hello. It has a single task called server. Its goal state is running. Its command is echo hello world. It's going to use 0 0.1 CPUs and 256 megs of RAM. And it's basically the, the outcome of this is a task that is just going to loop constantly, right? Because it's going to keep finishing. It's going to exit cleanly, and then our scheduler is going to identify, no, that is bad. I want, I want to keep you alive. So if I pop open terminal, OK. And unlike you suckers, I already have the Docker container. All right. So now I'm in here. And as you may have noticed, we have this delightful thing where I just give you some AWS credentials. Um, so I'm kind of just going to go ahead. If, if you already have the Docker container, follow along. I think if you don't already have it, by the time you get it, you should be able to jump ahead. We're going to slow down as soon as we start like, actually interacting with the cluster. Actually, we're going to have to do the whole cluster provisioning thing, so we should get to that anyways. Um, so do, do, do. All right, now for the fun part. So I have my own cluster. Uh, so all of these clusters are DCOS 110. Are they enterprise or open, Jorg? Okay. Oh, yes, yes. OK. So if we pop over here, uh, I lost the gist. So Jorg has very kindly spun up lots and lots of clusters for us. So all right, we're going to, so many. So as I said, uh, I think, do we have enough for everybody to have one, or are we doing pairs still? No. Pairs, OK. Uh, so I'm going to point at people and tell you which one you are. Uh, 
Let's see how this goes. Uh, can you give me edit on this, Jorg, so I can? Yeah, let's just do that. All right, so momentarily we will all be able to edit this and then you will, we will engage in a very fun distributed systems problem, which is a bunch of human beings all trying to pick the same thing at the same time. Uh, there we go. All right, so basically uh, find a buddy and go ahead and grab a cluster. Just write your name down that you have taken it. And once you got that, look at me, like stare at me so I know that you're done uh, or raise your hand or something. Yeah, everybody should have edit. You might just have to reload. All right, so once you have your cluster, <clears throat> the command you want to run is DCOS cluster setup space, and then your cluster URL. It's then going to prompt you for a user. The user is bootstrap user. Well, first it's going to ask you a yes or no question. You should blindly say yes. Uh, you're actually technically agreeing to a URL. No, it's just an SSH thing. Uh, so user is bootstrap user, and password is delete me. This is just the default user that you get when you first install DCOS Enterprise. All right, does anybody still not have the Docker image? Impressive. Same exact people. All right, we're making great progress with the internet. Okay, so. Hello world. All right, so we all want to find in our favorite text editor the YAML file. So you can see here, it's very simple. It is basically just going to loop and say hello world. So the first thing we're gonna do, once we have everything set up, you got your cluster, you're gonna type in build.sh, you're going to say AWS. Basically, it's going to build. It's then going to upload, upload the built assets plus the stub universe to a S3 bucket. This is also going to take a while. So this is a great time if people have questions. It went through everything, but it failed to upload the stub to S3. Is it? What was the error? Was the error? Interesting. Yeah. There should be a. There should be a very clear either access tonight or. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll see how this. That should work fine. Yes, sir. Uh huh. So I helped develop a state for SOS frameworks, but the state is kind of reach is pretty dynamic in that it's essentially a distributed solar instance. Okay.
Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question is, is basically, uh, can you use it for things like jobs, right? Like, can you use it for jobs to where you scale out and then you finish and you want it all to go away, right? Yeah. So we're gonna. Uh, someone's doing that right now uh, on the team, right? Like, we're working on that for Spark, essentially. Um, so it. It's a very common, right, like, and, and that also sort of speaks to a general thing you see, like uh, the Edge LB that we've released. Um, there's sort of this concept of like a meta scheduler where like you want to deploy these things, right? I mean, that's what Spark is, like the Spark dispatcher is a meta scheduler that deploys Spark jobs that are themselves schedulers. And we're working towards sort of having sufficient support for doing that sort of thing of like go and do this and then finish and then go, go away kind of thing. Yes, sir. Right, Marathon is focused. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question is, in comparison to Marathon, what is the benefit of using the SDK? So with Marathon, Marathon is quite good at stateless scheduling. Uh, it has some amount of support for persistence, but not a ton. And additionally, it doesn't have particularly complex orchestration, right? So like, if you sort of think about it, it, like a marathon app is, as far as I know, you basically can get like a single image, right? Like a marathon app would be like a single pod type, right? So if you wanted to sort of copy what the SDK does, you would need to launch a bunch of marathon apps, right? So that's sort of one. The orchestration is quite simple. Um, our support for persistent resources is a good amount stronger. Also, additionally, uh, so when we make, when we place tasks, right, when we deploy pods, we do full reservation of everything, right, which means that we can always restart again and again in the same spot and never have to compete with um, other users of the cluster, whereas Marathon doesn't have those guarantees. Could be that the uh, AWS. The yeah. Could be that the AWS nuke your credentials when you put them on the internet accidentally hammer has gotten a lot faster. But we shall see. Gradle's very large. Okay, so let's let's just sort of go through the presentation. We can always I see what you're saying. So uh, the sort of question is, uh, his association with Stateful would be things like Rexray. Sort of the, and I guess are you sort of specifically saying the ability to like move between hosts? Yeah. yeah so, so our view would be, so in terms of state, um, so we don't actually support external storage providers yet. Uh, but what we do support are persistent, like, right. Yeah. Um, well, the SDK does not. I, DCOS and Mesos do, the SDK doesn't, right? So we focus on host-mounted persistent volumes via Mesos, where stateful, like, there are many reasons you want your tasks to keep landing in the same spot, right? In terms of, like, you might have pinned it to very specific hosts that you want things to land on because they have fat drives for Cassandra, that kind of thing. Um, many of the network-attached storage choices might not have the performance that you want for a data service. So in terms of stateful, it's, it's very much a, like, tasks don't get to just move, like, flit around a cluster, right? right? And there's, there's a lot of different things where that would be true. Like, memcache is not a great example. It's a good example for this tutorial because it's very quick to sort of throw together. Um, but in the sort of Cassandra's and HDFS's of the world, right, like, you very much want things to keep landing in exactly the same spot. Um, okay, so hello world. Uh, what are we doing? Get in there. Uh, either bring the host back, or you would replace the pods that are sitting on that host, and they will get moved to a different host. Is that, 
no. User intervention. We do not touch data destructively unless someone says, touch this data destructively. Um, yeah, I mean, so they would just be monitoring, right? Like, they would be monitoring Cassandra, and through that they would see, like, oh, that node went away, and then they would be able to go and reschedule it somewhere else. Okay, so Hello World, uh, very simple example. So what does sort of the development cycle look like with the SDK? Essentially, we build, then we install, then we test whatever we wanted to test, then we do an uninstall. Uh, in this case, oh, haha, these slides are old. Um, but basically, so uninstall, what does it do? It goes through and it puts the scheduler into an uninstall mode. It then proceeds to unreserve everything it had reserved and then walk away, leaving a very clean cluster that you can put other things on. And then you just sort of loop through that again and again. Huh. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're sharing a cluster, uh, I mean, you could both run it, and then you'll sort of just compete uh, for whose memcache runs or not. OK, so let's look at how we'll actually start to do memcache, right? So I've, I've built a Docker image that has memcache on it. Uh, it's not going to come up and try to run it or anything like that. So basically, the simplest possible case of memcache is to say, yes, I want three of these using this Docker image, and then I'm going to put the command in as memcache, right? It's going to launch three tasks, sorry, three pods. Each of them has a single task. It's going to reserve one CPU and a gig of memory for each one. Memcache is just going to turn on. Neat, right? It's a very simple, most basic possible example. OK. So this was a bad, like this was bad. This, this has created a toxic framework that is doing something very bad that Mesos has problems with, which is port reservations. So Mesos has zero enforcement about ports. It is the honor system and like not a particularly honorable system. So what we did in, silently here in the background by turning on memcache is we stole the port 11 to 11, right? So to be good citizens, we can come in here instead and we can actually leverage some nice features. Like obviously, hey, I want to stack a bunch of different memcache frameworks that, you know, I have a bunch of developers, I want to stack them all on the same cluster. I don't really care about them overlapping because it's all different memcaches. Um, just some nice syntactic sugar to be like, hey, give me a random port, give it this nvar, um, and then advertise. We'll see in a bit. Basically, it just means when someone calls the endpoints command, tell them that this endpoint is available. And then you can see we just modify to say, hey, you should listen on the Mesos container IP, which is the private IP of the agent. So it's whatever IP you start the agent with. Excuse me. And then uh, you should use this port, which is the memcache port, which again is coming from this random port that it is assigned. Pretty much always you're going to get 1025 because there's no other ports taken. But that's just a side effect of having your own little empty cluster. So again, this sort of just stresses, right? Like we make all of these reservations. Some of them are not enforced, right? So a great example is when you have multiple tasks that you know, they each have their own different CPU and memory settings, mm, cool. They're just going to share. Like everything in a pod is going to share. Executors, like everything under an executor shares a C group. There's no enforcement there yet. There probably will be someday. Essentially, within a pod, the things that are shared are network namespace, C groups, and then the only real isolation is that the sandbox and mounts are different. Right? Like if you, if you want a volume to be available to all tasks in a pod, you need to put it at the pod level. If you put it at the task level, it will not be visible to everybody. Uh, same for the sandbox. If you do something in the sandbox in one task, you will not see it in the other task. Same for environment also, right? Like uh, the tasks inherit the environment of their executor. They do not share environments with their task neighbors. Oh, it's so close. This is doing a go get of 50 kilobytes that takes a very long time on this network. OK, so let's talk a bit about, so uh, in terms of when you're developing, task exec is your friend. So task exec is basically a way to specify what is actually uh, a regex. Uh, cache zero server is basically going to match. Like if there's only a single task that matches that, it'll hop into it. Otherwise, it'll tell you, like, here's all the tasks that match the regex you've given me. Um, so task exec dash it bin bash. 
It's exactly the same as if you had SSH'd, but the very cool thing is this is exactly as if you were that container. We sort of just, task exec is just plopping a little container right at the same level of nesting. You get to share the environment of whatever task you're hopping into. You can see everything it can see, super useful. I used it while I was doing this to do some debugging around a shared volume, because it was like I couldn't figure out why one task could see it and one task couldn't. And I still don't really know, but I made it work, so I feel very accomplished. Um, and then in terms of trying it out, uh, basically uh, the container also includes netcat, and we'll be able to, once we get it running, just do some simple netcat commands to memcache. Part of the reason I picked memcache, it's very easy to talk to it with clients. <coughs> so, uh, configuration templates. So obviously when you have these complex services, they all, pretty much all of them have these large, unwieldy configuration files that you need to pipe things into. The way that we handle that is that we essentially give you the ability to write mustache templates that are then populated from the environment of the task using our bootstrap utility. So the bootstrap utility uh, is available in all your frameworks. You do have to explicitly include it as a URI, at least for now, and then you run it whenever you want, right? So you might not necessarily want to run it as the very first thing in a command. You might want to do some other setup, calculate some NVARs that are then going to get templated in your template files, uh, and then, but obviously you're going to ultimately want to run it before you run your server task. So Bootstrap does a couple other nice things. It'll allow you to wait for DNS resolution on certain things. So both Mesos DNS and then Spartan, the slightly fancier DNS of DCOS, uh, are not instant, right? Like it has to propagate to some extent. So it'll let you do things. A very common uh, loop that we have in our stuff is to basically sit there waiting, like, okay, like wait a minute until DNS has resolved, because if I try to launch this thing and like it tries to talk to its fellows, like it's just gonna freak out. So let's sort of wait until the DNS record actually exists before we proceed. Uh, what other fun things can you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can also uh, install certs. We also default that to true. Uh, this isn't really applicable going forward in 110. We used to have a, we have a custom executor in 1.9, um, and that needs the certs for certain things. Okay, so if we look at our configuration templates, so you can see that here we are adding configs. We'll call it memcache. Uh, the template, um, that is just a convenient NVAR to pick up the location. This actually got a little bit better uh, the next version of the SDK, you won't have to remember to throw this magic NVAR in there. Um, so you might notice that there's actually like, wait, why is there mustache templating into my service YAML? So the way this works is the scheduler reads essentially a mustached YAML, and it uses its environment to populate it, right? And that environment is coming from the Marathon app, and that is ultimately coming from the options that the user supplied when they install the package. So you can see here, we're basically taking this very simple configuration file. We're throwing in the memory limit, the memcache port, and the Mesos container IP, and then there's also a listen on localhost, so it's a little bit easier to talk to. Um, so you can see there, we're also adding memory limit to the environment, and then, uh, so we're doing bootstrap, memcached, and then I'm just catting the memcached.conf, because in my container I couldn't figure out how to get it to read from it in the right place, so we're just doing a cat. And cool, let's see how we're doing over here. Yes. Okay, so jump all the way back. So this is a very simple hello world. So I, we can take a look at yours in a bit. I'm not sure why it didn't upload. Is anybody else able to do build? Or has anybody tried? Do yours work? Uh, okay. I would double check your AWS configuration. Um, okay, neat. So. Essentially that dev loop again, right? So you build, okay, neat. You've now built, you have, uh, what you wind up with at the end is this right here is basically adding what you just built as a stub universe, and then the package install is just gonna install it with whatever the default options are. As you noticed, we aren't really templating very much in this, so an actual productionized install would have a bunch of mustache templating, and a bunch of things in your marathon environment, and a bunch of things in your options file, um, but that is neither a compelling demo um, and probably would scare you away. So it's not super great. So we're gonna do the very simple where we're just touching our YAML, at least for today. So if I go ahead.
Uh, I have noticed the installing CLI subcommand is taking an atrociously long time. So I, uh, there we go. It worked. Neat. So as you can see, so DCOS memcache is just the uh, CLI module for this framework. And we can do fun things with it. Let's see, plan. Oops. Cool. So as you can see, the deploy plan that it self-calculated is very simple. It has the hello pod. It has the hello zero server. And it is bringing it up and saying, yeah, it's complete. Uh, the fun part is, so because of the fact that this one, if you recall, is literally just an echo. It's just going to keep finishing, right? So I should be able to see here that our recovery plan is going to sit here constantly trying to restart this thing. If you look at the output of DCOS task, you'll see it's running right now. Well, it's staging then. And then if we go into what I would refer to as the Mesos Framework Developer UI, or the Mesos UI, because it is nice and speedy, you can see here we have a bunch of wah, hello zero server tasks that are all going through finished. If we hop in here, we can look at their standard out. And we can see hello world. Neat. So, uh, so again, that dev cycle, right? So OK, we're going to move on to the next one. What do we want to do? We want to do DCOS package uninstall memcache. Uh, this is going to very annoyingly, sorry, I wrote this code, prompt you to type in the name. And it's also going to very scarily tell you this is going to delete all of your persistent data, logs, configurations, database artifacts, et cetera. That's because that is exactly what uninstall does. It is going to go through and unreserve all your volumes. It's going to destroy your scheduler. It is a gnarly and dangerous process. Don't do uninstall unless you don't want the data anymore. Um, you can actually do a dash dash yes, and it will skip that warning. So maybe don't tell everyone that you work with that. Uh, so what happens? So we'll actually see. There we go. So you can actually see. So hello zero server is sitting here in the failed state, and the reason is just that the scheduler is, has just been rebooted, and it hasn't reconciled yet, and acknowledged that task state. Uh, so the way uninstall works is we restart the scheduler. So any new goal state for the scheduler is a restart, right? Like any configuration change, anything like that, we restart the scheduler with a new sort of immutable goal state. And in the uninstall case, that goal state is get rid of everything and then die. So essentially what it does, Cosmos restarts it in uninstall mode. It kills all of its tasks. It receives back all of the reservations that it had made. It unreserves all of those things. And then it um, deletes all of the bookkeeping that it's doing in ZK. So we keep state, like we track everything in ZK. Uh, and then it basically then just says, I'm, I'm done uh, via its deploy plan. And then Cosmos deletes it um, via Marathon. Uh, essentially, because you have to have, the, uh, you need user credentials to do the, the final step. So Cosmos essentially holds the user credentials in limbo while it's waiting. Yeah, so there we go. So yeah, and so just what happens, like, right? So if your scheduler is down and a task fails, it will, you actually get this weird state where it shows as active but failed. And it's just because no scheduler has acknowledged. Like, the scheduler has not acknowledged that, like, oh, yes, I agree. That task is dead now. All right, so it's gone. We're going to go to our handy dandy cheat sheet. And copy in the super basic memcache. We'll do a fortunately much faster build. Uh, the network connection here is actually bizarrely asymmetric. And the uploads are like four times the bandwidth of the downloads, which I do not understand and never will. Um, does anybody have any questions about what we've covered so far? Yes, sir. Can I get a 
Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Which one are you? Okay. Thanks, Jörg. Uh, anyone, anyone else technical difficulties? Let's do uh, any technical difficulties. Otherwise, no? Okay, question. Yes. Okay. So to be very, uh, yes, to be very clear, so, th so the question was, like, can I use, can I run Kafka or Cassandra using this? Yes. yes. The Kafka, Cassandra, Elastic, HDFS, Confluent Kafka, and DSE packages are this. Like, it's YAML and a bit of Java. That is all they are. Ah, I see. No. So it is a multi-scheduler, right? Every service has its own scheduler. Okay. It is not a mono-scheduler, right? It, it, it is not Aurora or Marathon or the new one Uber is building, um, okay. right? But it, it is a different model, right? It, it is the model of multi-schedulers versus... Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, you can build all of them with the SDK, and we have. Um, yeah. I think, yes. Another question is, so, um, so Kafka, you mentioned it's more for one executor talk, right? Mm -hmm. So we can run multiple um, Kafka to under one executor. And what if one of them decides uh, the CPU, um, does it will automatically shrink, resize down, or it, uh, it will stay the same? Um, yeah, so the question was, when you have a, um, Right, so our executor, right, is a, a set of task groups, right? So uh, pod lines up with executor, task group lines up with our tasks, right? So when we deploy a pod, we statically reserve all of its resources. We look at the total sum. So there's a concept of resource sets where essentially a set of tasks, some number of tasks under the pod, can all use the same resource set. They cannot, it means those tasks cannot run at the same time, but that they don't need their own sets of resources. And so we look at the sum total of resource sets and then individual resource allocations within the tasks, and we statically reserve that entire chunk. And we never touch it. We don't shrink it or grow it depending on what's running. No. Yeah, so the question was, like, if, so say you had uh, 10 tasks in your pod, they're all running. If one of them dies, uh, it's off. Is it? Yeah. Uh, no, I was, I was going to maybe hand it to someone to talk into, but. Um, but yeah, sorry, so the, the question, uh, yeah, so, okay, so you, you have 10 tasks in your pod, all of them are running, one of them dies, there's no changes to C groups or anything, right? Like, it is all one big atomic unit as far as the C group is concerned. Okay, so, neat. So, again, uh, I very conveniently can just copy this in, I'm basically going to remove the existing package repository, add in the new stub universe, and then install it with the defaults. Watch over here. All right, so our scheduler is coming up. Um, in terms of, let's look at some fun scheduler logs. So you'll see the scheduler. Uh, the scheduler is brand new. It had no previous config, so it's just going to see its current config. It's going to say neat. There's no other configs to compare it to. Skipping config, uh, skipping config diff, there's no old target config. And so at this point, it's just waiting to start its API server. 
It's already, you can see here, uh, we acquire a ZK lock just to make sure that there are no two schedulers running that think they are the same scheduler. And then it is waiting to have its API server up and running. Oh, no, it just got desynced. Uh, okay, let's walk through this. So I think it's, it's definitely useful to sort of see, like, how does the scheduler interact? There we go. Okay. So... Cool. So you can see here, we basically, we get an offer set, right? We then process those offers. We, we essentially build a set of launch criteria for the Cache Zero server. You can see here, we're then checking in evaluation stages. We're just seeing like, okay, it has enough CPU, it has enough memory, uh, it has the disk we're looking for, which isn't really any. Um, so there is uh, the executor, we have to give it 256 megs of like host disk or it doesn't work. So we always end up doing that. Um, so you can see here what we essentially do. Um, so the astute and frequent Mesos users may be familiar with the fact that there is no uh, feedback on operations with Mesos, except for one, which is launch. So what we do is we stack everything into a big stack, right? So you see here, like these are not uh, sequential operations. These are all sent as a single set to Mesos. And we then get feedback on the launch, right? So if like any one of these, like if the reserve, like if, if this fourth reserve failed, um, we'll just get a failure on the launch. And the way we process that is we can then just sort of walk away from those resources and it'll come back around, get offered to us, and we'll be like, wait, I don't care about these resources. I never used them. We'll throw them away. Um, and we will have proceeded with different offers to try to schedule. OK, so you can kind of see, you can kind of get a sense for it. Um, so you can see here. Here's its final step, right? So it's saying, OK, uh, it's processing the deploy plan, has the candidate of cache to server, uh, it then looks at offers. So it builds an, off, an offer evaluation pipeline, it then looks at the offers, had a pass for all of them. It's going to do the five reservation option, operations, and then it's going to finally issue the launch. So and you can see here, we have all the cache servers running. So let's go ahead and poke at it. So I can do DCOS task exec dash IT. Uh, cache zero server. So you can see there, it pops me right into the sandbox of that task. And if I do environment, you can actually see, so I'm sharing exactly the same environment. You can see there's my Mesos container IP, there's my memcache version, framework name, et cetera. Um, you can see framework host. So one thing I haven't commented on, so every task winds up with a, uh, two DNS entries, right? There's a Mesos DNS entry. Uh, the primary entry that we use is the Spartan entry, which looks like this. So this task's IP address would be cache-0, or its DNS address would be cache-0, dash server, dot memcache, dot auto IP, dot DCOS, dot this DCOS, dot directory. Because long DNS names are fun, I guess. That can be the only reason that they made it that long, is my assumption. Um, OK, neat. So if we do netcat, localhost, because we haven't configured anything yet. Cool. So you see there, we're talking to memcache. Cool. Uh, so memcache is running, at least. But as I already talked about, we didn't actually reserve the port that we're using, so we're being very bad framework citizens. So in lieu of doing that dev cycle yet another time, uh, I'm going to kind of skip over this one and go right into adding a template. So first, because uninstall does take a non-zero amount of time, we're going to kick off the uninstall. So we will have a clean cluster. Then copy this over. So you can see here, so Bootstrap is already in the Marathon environment. That is just a URI to a 
pre-built version of the Bootstrap utility. Uh, so when we release the SDK, so we release, uh, so the current GA release is 0.30.0 is the version. So you actually see that here. Uh, in terms of like the dependencies you'd be pulling in are just these three. Um, and then we also release fixed versions of the custom executor for 1.9 clusters and the bootstrap utility for all clusters. And those can be consumed, and you can see that in the resource.json right here. So there's our executor, and there's our bootstrap. Um, they're both version 0.30.0. OK. So again, just quickly, so here's our config template. We're going to run Bootstrap. That will template everything into it. Uh, we obviously need the config template to do that. So we'll pop a new file in. And copy this over. Do that fun thing where I, I kill for time while it builds. Um, all right, anybody got any questions about what we've gone over so far? Things that they are wondering about can the SDK solve this problem for me or this other problem? No? Okay. Uh, who wants to give an example of something they would be interested in building with the SDK? Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what was that? NC router. NC router? It's like it Yeah, no, that would definitely be a good. Yes, it can do that. It can do HDFS. Uh, if you can do HDFS, you can do just about anything except for a relational database. We have not added the correct primitives for relational databases yet. All right, so throwing that in there. OK. So one of the. Uh, Scheduler's cool tricks is it serves as a very simple artifact server, right? Like there is no sort of built-in blob store for Mesos or DCOS, so we need somewhere to stick those configuration templates. Uh, the scheduler is that place. As you can see, the dist file is where we put stuff. That gets distributed with the jar. The scheduler comes up. One of the APIs is artifacts, and it then serves those out. Let's see if we got, cool. So you can actually see config templates. That got shot in there. And yeah, there we go. So you can see here, here's the untemplated version. And then if we look at standard error, we can see the output of bootstrap. So you can see bootstrapping. Bootstrap by default will print you your environment. Uh, this is very, very, very helpful when you're debugging things. So we can see here that dynamic port has been uh, put in the environment via that environment variable. We have the memory limit there. There we go. And then you can actually see here, Bootstrap sat there. So by default, Bootstrap will just try to resolve its own host, right? And then move on. So it was able to resolve it. And then now it sort of very nicely logs for you, like, hey, here's the template. I took the template. Here's the final output. I wrote it. And then we can see that Bootstrap was successful. And then here you can see the very verbose logging of memcache. And sort of to prove that I'm not lying, that it's actually using it. Let's see. Let's hop back into that same task. Uh, if I try localhost 11.211, connection refused. OK, what if I do localhost memcache port? Hey, what do you know? Cool. Okay. Uh, exit back out of there. Okay. Uh, 
OK, cool. So sidecar plans. So like we talked about, sidecar plans uh, are essentially a way to have exposed to operators ways to interact with the service while leveraging all that orchestration, right? Like, like obviously, it would be very simple. Uh, so let's say, right, like, why use this over Marathon? OK, so let's say I wrote a Marathon app that is just a bunch of memcache servers. Cool. What if I want to flush the cache? Well, it's easy. You know, you just like write a shell script that like calls netcat and it like echoes the flush command. Okay, cool. How do I run that against all of them? Well, that's easy. You write another script that like finds all of them and then like issues that command again. Oh, uh, it starts to get very complicated. Sidecars are a great way to basically have a plan that runs against some number of the pods via additional little tasks that you've added into the pod definitions. You can do all sorts of things. So sort of the what are good examples, right? So Cassandra, we have backup and restore. So you can issue both uh, a backup, and then you can also restore from a backup via sidecar plans, where it'll you know, send it up to Azure or uh, S3. Um, we also have, I think we have, yeah, there's other various Cassandra sidecars. I think we have some in Elastic, but I'm not sure. Um, so neat. What is our goal? We want to flush each cache in each node. Flesh each the wow, it's a great sentence. All right, so first thing we're going to do, we are going to add an executor volume. So what is a, a cool thing is that I have a dynamic port. Very cool. Where does that dynamic port wind up? It winds up in the environment of my task. Oh, I need another task for flushing the cache. That doesn't share the same environment. Well, shoot. All right, how can I get around this? Like, well, I, as an SDK developer, might just go add pod level ports. Um, but in the interim, what I can do is I can throw a volume on the pod, so basically an executor level volume, just a tiny little one. I'll put it at the path shared. This will allow me to share state between sidecar tasks and the primary task. So then we basically write, all right, so let's write down the dynamic port, right? So we're going to echo the value of memcache port into shared slash memcache port. And then in our sidecar task, so we write down that we want the goal to be finished, meaning like, hey, complete this, and then you're done. Like, run it till it completes. But after that, uh, good. So, excuse me, we're then going to echo flush all netcat uh, dash q10, which just makes netcat finish when it receives into file uh, localhost, and then we'll just cat shared memcache port onto that. So you can see here, I'm using a very minimal number of CPUs and memory. Uh, again, the total footprint of your executor is a little tiny bit of overhead for the executor itself. And then additionally, uh, the total CPUs and memory of all of your tasks added together. And we do, like, right, so that's sort of why uh, if you have lots and lots of sidecar tasks, you want them to use a single resource set. A great example of that is Cassandra. Cassandra has, like, 10 sidecar tasks. And if they all had their own sufficient resources allocated to them, the footprint of Cassandra would be like, here's Cassandra, and then here's the sidecars. So instead, with a single resource set, you're able to share resources between them, but never at the same time for obvious reasons. OK, cool. So our overall plans, uh, as soon as you add a single plan, you then have to write down your deploy plan, or it gets sad, which is technically a bug. So I filed a bug against that guy. Uh, it's because deploy, right, you're never going to have a naive deploy. Naive deploy is never going to work. All right, so we'll write down flush all serial and flush all parallel, the only difference being a serial versus parallel strategy, right? So serial means do this one, wait for it to finish, do the next one, wait for it to finish, do the next one, wait for it to finish. Parallel means do them all, do them all right now. So, uh, aha. All right, so let's go ahead. If we pop over here, ah, go. And oops, I forgot to say uninstall already. So kick off the build. Uh, does anybody have any questions about sidecars, volumes? Yes, sir.
Gotcha. So, right, the way we get around this is when we are evaluating, can we, yeah, sorry, yes. Uh, the question is, how do you ensure, so right, you, you have some number of sidecar tasks, how do you make sure that you can actually launch those where you're intending to launch them, right? So the way we do that is when we are making those reservations, we make the reservation for the entire footprint of the pod, right? Meaning if, if you had eight tasks, each one of those tasks requests one CPU and a gig of memory, the total, the total footprint we are looking for in a single offer is going to be eight CPUs and eight gigs of memory, right? So the reason for that is we want to make sure that we can super duper for sure run that sidecar when you ask us to, right? It would be very easy to be like, I mean, well, it would be easy. It would actually be kind of difficult to be like, well, let's wait until we get an offer that's on exactly the right agent that has like the right number of CPUs. Like, no, we want to statically reserve when we launch the pod, the entire footprint of the pod, so that at any time we can turn on or off any given site, and not really turn on or off, we can launch the tasks and the ones that reach finished states reach finished states and we stop trying to launch them, the ones that have running states start running and we keep them running. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead and start this installing. So this is a great example. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so while I was writing this, uh, I was doing this echo real bad. And uh, so this task was winding up being able to, so this task could see that file. But then this task could not see that file. So how did I debug that? Right? Super annoying. All I did is I went in here. And I said sleep forever. And then that means my little flush cast task, I can, I can start the plan, right? It'll come up. And it's just sleeping forever. So I can hop into it with task exec, and then I am exactly as though I am that task, right? I can see what it sees. I can see that, like, OK, it can see the shared volume, but like, why can't it see the file? And I can compare the two different tasks and see, like, what are the permissions? What weird thing have I done? Um, and then via that, I was able to correct the bizarre way that I was writing that file. And we're actually going to work on features that are a better version than having to edit your thing and put in sleeps. OK, cool. So you can see here, let's actually plan show deploy. So you can see our deploy plan is complete. Very cool. Hey, let's make sure nothing's in recovery. Nope. No recoveries have been initiated ever. Uh, let's do memcache. It's like, what was the name of that plan? OK, cool. Flush all serial or flush all parallel. Plan start. Flush all serial. OK. Show. So you can see there, it's quite quick. The first one already finished. If we go in here, look at standard out. So that is what you get when you, when you send flush all to memcache. It just returns OK. Very cool, very simple. Um, so let's abuse this a little bit. So let's see here. So here's the total set of commands. Um, so we have actions we can take on plans, actions we can take on pods. Uh, there's some debugging stuff down here. Um, updates are a feature in DCOS Enterprise Edition only on 110 plus. Basically, it's a, a way uh, in your package metadata that you can codify an upgrade path, meaning like you can go from this version of the package to this other version of the package, and it'll like super duper for sure work. No other paths being allowed outside of that mechanism. All right, so let's look at the pods. So we have all these pods, cool. So if you look at, uh, let's touch this bad boy. So cache to server. Right, so uh, I think someone had asked, like, what do you do when an agent dies? Okay, cool, well, let's say it's catastrophic failure, right? Like, this agent is just never coming back. Then you would go in here, you would say pod replace. What that's going to do is, as you can see, so we, there we go, stopped. 
Uh, so it killed cache zero server. In the background, the scheduler is, uh, uh, it is unreserving all those resources, and then it is rescheduling it, right? Uh, fun thing about replace, replace does not guarantee agent movement. However, if that agent had actually been dead, right, like there's no way you would have landed on it again because Mesos is not offering it to anyone. So again, like replace is destructive, right? So d replace is basically saying like every volume, unreserve it, destroy, um, or I guess it's not unreserved with the volume, it's just destroy. So, and same deal, uh, replace has its much less destructive cousin, restart. So you can see here, just started it again. I can do a restart. Now if we look at our recovery plan, we'll see that that's where those were showing up. Yeah, you can see there, the restart goes through. We can see it just started again. Go in and look, we'll see it's bootstrapped nicely. Cool. All right. Okay, what can't the SDK do? Yes, sir. Is there an easy way to have the plans start on the schedule, or do you just go and put it for something in Kronos? To yeah, Kronos would be a great way to do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, nothing built in, and I would say the, the, the SDK scheduler should not do that, right? Like separation of concerns, like, you know, use Jenkins, use Kronos, use Cron, yeah. Like the, the scheduler, uh, our, we are fairly opinionated. Our view is that its job is to be a very good meso scheduler and schedule tasks, right? Like that, that is what it does. It is not an API server for connecting all sorts of stuff, like it is, it is, singular purpose, and it is very good at the thing that it does. So speaking of what, do, what does it do, right? So, so what do we do today? Uh, we have horizontal scale out, meaning, hey, I want to add more instances of a pod. I have vertical scaling. I want to go up or down for CPUs and memory of my pods, right? If I, if I increase CPU or memory, it's going to do a rolling restart with whatever the update plan is, rolling out across the whole clusters. Service discovery, right? You get automated DNS entries that are very predictable and reliable easy to consume within the framework for orchestration. Virtual networks, uh, so DCOS supports virtual networks, basically via CNI. Um, we interface nicely with that. Uh, there's a built-in one in DCOS you can try out. It's just called DCOS. Uh, it's just a DCOS overlay. Um, so we have readiness checks and health checks. So readiness checks are, I am not ready until this check returns thumbs up. Health checks are, excuse me, I am bad and should be killed when this health check is unhealthy a certain number of times, right? So pretty much anything productionized, you definitely want a readiness check, right? Uh, Cassandra, a great readiness check is like, does node tool think you're part of the ring? As an example, uh, health checks um, can actually kind of hurt more than they can help sometimes, because it's, right, it's like, uh, do you, you know, you, a great example is like Elastic. We were finding that health checks were actually really annoying for Elastic. Uh, because you might have a bad GC, like your GCs might over time line up, and then suddenly you don't have like availability on the data thing, and then like, wait, it starts killing nodes, and you're like, wait a second, no, 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 it would have been fine, just leave it. Um, so in terms of, yeah, health checks can be kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, you can do custom recovery, so in terms of you can write some Java to have custom recovery around specific node types, things like that. Uh, I gave the example of Cassandra. Um, CockroachDB, for theirs, they have um, a bit of extra logic around like, are you a, uh, the master or one of the replicas? And then the same deal for like initial start, I think is a little bit different than if it's being brought back. Resource sets, um, I talked about but didn't show an example of. So resource sets are the idea of you can define a resource set at the pod level and then tasks can share that resource set. They cannot use it at the same time, but it's essentially a way to have lots and lots of tasks with a relatively small resource footprint for a pod. Operator-friendly tools, so as you saw, the APIs around sort of pod management, plan management, endpoints. Oh, I should show endpoints. Um, let's see. So endpoints, right, if I want to actually connect and do something meaningful, <clears throat> how do I do that? Why 
Where are you sad? Thank you. I like to think I would have eventually figured it out, but I probably wouldn't have. I don't know. Okay. Uh, all right, so endpoints, we just have one, memcache. So you can see here, provides all of the IP addresses and the DNS. Oh, a feature that I didn't show, so uh, DCOS has a concept of a VIP, like a virtual IP, it's just a load balance IP address. Um, you can use one of those. Like obviously a lot of data services don't necessarily consume those because data services, the clients are pretty smart. They want to know all the IP addresses of everyone they can talk to, and then they do their own client-side logic. Um, but you can definitely use them if you want to. Okay, cool. Um, sidecars, the ability to define tasks that can then be run in their own little plans as additional maintenance or operational procedures. Uh, placement constraints, so we have full support of the sort of marathon-style placement constraints, so in terms of like Host name unique is kind of the default one that we always have because, like, hey, data services like shouldn't land on the same host. Um, you can do things like have it match a regex of host names. Let's say you have specific storage instances you want your database to land on. You would just put in a regex that'll match the right host names. You could always have the brute force regex of like this host name or this one or this one. Um, configuration templating, as you saw, the ability to template out configuration files just like you would with Chef or Puppet or others. So rolling updates, right? So uh, anytime you update the scheduler with a new configuration, it is going to diff it. It's going to see, hey, how do I move to that new state? It's going to proceed in a safe manner to that new state, basically dependent on whatever the update plan is. Or if there is no update plan, it'll follow the deploy plan. Um, rolling upgrades, so that's binaries, right? Same deal, where the diff is that like, hey, the binaries changed. Like it's got a new URL that it's supposed to download Java from, so let's roll out the new Java to Cassandra. Uh, we have support for GPUs. So if your cluster has GPUs, we can use them, yay. Uh, Fine-grained plan control. Um, so you can both define relatively complex plans. Uh, there are APIs I didn't show for interacting with plans around both sort of getting yourself out of sticky situations where you can force complete past steps um, or stopping and starting plans, things like that. Uh, there's some different, uh, there are two additional strategies I didn't show, plus you can write your own custom strategies, but those strategies are uh, canary serial and canary parallel, and the strategies there basically mean do one and then wait until I tell you to do the next one, right? So that's a great candidate for like, I'm going to do a configuration update of Kafka. I should try one, right? Like, I did it in staging, but like, let's try one in production before we hop on forward. Um, in EE, we have uh, deep support for secrets in DCOS. Uh, we also have support for security. So DCOS Enterprise has uh, strict mode, which is basically enforces a bunch of ACLs, both in Mesos um, and DCOS land. Um, and then finally, in EE, we have uh, automated TLS provisioning, right? So that's to basically be able to say, like, I want a TLS certificate with the right um, TLDs for my task and that kind of thing. Uh, so what did I not talk about? So there is no horizontal scaling. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Oh, yes, you guys never get to leave. Uh, all right, horizontal scaling. So we, we horizontal scaling's tough. Uh, hard to scale down, right? Some services, I don't even know what that means to say scale down. Some are like kind of easy and like we'll, you know, at a future date, the SDK will build the primitives to make this possible. Uh, it is not something we support today. 
Um, racks, uh, support for racks is in Mesos. We're working on, like, I think support for racks and DCOS is like a PR that's going to close, and then like we're going to add racks. I mean, great. Uh, graceful shutdown, we like sort of have it done, um, but not in a way that people should use yet. Um, so then, so right, graceful shutdown is like send a signal that is agreed upon, and then wait some amount of time, and then send the other signal that means like no, you actually die now. Um, external volumes, so like Rex Ray, CSI. So CSI, uh, that we're going to sort of skip the Rex Rays of the world and go right to CSI. Right, like when CSI is done, so container storage interface, when that kind of stuff is done, when Portworx and others implement it, um, we will consume it to allow you to provision volumes on the fly for persistence and things like that. Um, stateless pods, so sort of the idea of like having a pod that is a bit more ephemeral, that's kind of coupled in some ways to scale in, um, but it's useful for things like analytics, stuff like that. Uh, we also don't integrate with the maintenance primitives of Mesos yet. Um, I think no one sort of does, supposedly, one framework does, um, but maybe we'll be the second one. So, yeah, I think that's, oh yeah, the SDK team's real big. Uh, this is actually the order in which people joined the team. Um, I haven't done that much of the SDK. Uh, Gabriel right there, if you wanna also ask him questions after this, he is the first person on this list, just to put him on the spot. Uh, he also had a talk earlier, if you wanna watch the recording of that. He's also got a talk from last year, kind of talking about like, his talk from last year is like, here are the principles of what we're going to build. And then this year it was like, we built it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that is it. Does anybody have questions? Or do you just wanna leave? Because this was very boring. Binary of scheduler. Right. Executors. Yeah, so the question is will the SDK at some point support some sort of format that would let you run it on vanilla Mesos? Yes, like on top of Marathon. Right. Um, so you could get pretty close today. Like you could just do it on Marathon. Right. So, so what does Cosmos do? Cosmos basically just lets you define these options files that then get templated into a Marathon app. Um, if you just sort of hand write the Marathon app that has the you know, sort of schedule library. The part that is missing is DNS, right? You aren't guaranteed with vanilla, like vanilla Mesos, great, doesn't come with a lot. Like it's a very good hardware abstraction, but it's kind of missing like DNS. That's the big CNI? one. Uh, CNI. You could use CNI and the Mesos DNS, something like that, and both IPs and service discovery and DNS records. Maybe. I don't think we would integrate with that right today. So do you have plans to do it, or it is optional and uh, it should be uploaded to community? Yeah, I mean, I would say if the community comes up with a solution, that would definitely be neat. Uh, it is not on our near-term roadmap. Because okay. yeah. everything, right, like it runs on top of open DCOS. So. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, rack awareness, the ability to say like, hey, like, uh, so the question was like, what do I mean by racks? Uh, so with Cassandra, right, like you don't want Cassandra nodes on the same rack for sufficient availability. Um, so you would want to be able to define like, what does a rack mean? Uh, Mesos has support for being able to say like, this agent is on this rack, uh, that support, we just need it to exist in DCOS and then we'll consume it and obviously have like some default constraints of like, don't put it on the same racks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can do it today, like, right, like attributes are sort of the, the shim, and then like Mesos has added racks as like a first class concept. Other folks? Okay, I release you to leave. Thank you.